zoom and all, you can put it way back there and zoom in. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord, and we want to thank you for who you are once again, Lord. We want to thank you for the life that you've given us, Lord. We want to thank you for the opportunity to gather together, Lord. Um, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're steering a little bit out of John today. Actually, way far out of John today. What is our purpose? <clears throat> what is our purpose? We spend so much time contemplating purpose. I know, I know um, in the world, when we're in the world, we spend so much time contemplating what am I doing? What am I supposed to be doing? What is this life for? Is this the only way that I'm supposed to live? What is my purpose? We fill our, our heads with all kinds of ideas, all kinds of things that, that we think sound good, like making money. I just need to make money. Where are you going to take it to? Or we want a big fancy house, cars, kids, wife, husband. All these things are good. These are all good things. It's not that that, that these desires are, are, are all bad. You know, of course, focusing solely on money is not a good idea. Or, or, or maybe we think that life is all about pleasure. <clears throat> And, and, and maybe about discovering new things or, or finding things or, or like what, what does it say in the Constitution? The pursuit of life, liberty, or life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we start making that gospel. And we start thinking that our whole life is, is based upon our seeking of happiness. That no matter what's going on, as long as I'm happy, then everything's going to be good. The world will tell you that to pursue whatever your heart desires. That the ultimate fulfillment is whatever makes you happy. It sounds really good though, doesn't it? Follow your heart, chase your desires, chase what, what it is that you want. Whether you want to gamble, a party, you like hookers, yeah. Just do whatever, or you want to. You're a man. You want to be a woman. I mean, just do whatever you want. Follow your heart. If that's speaking to somebody's heart, please, please, please. What the world tells us to follow your heart. That's the worst advice you could ever ever follow. Amen. Follow your heart. Your heart tells you to do stupid things. Your heart tells you to do things that, that please your flesh. That's what your heart really desires is to please the flesh. The Bible tells me in Jeremiah 17 that my heart is wicked and deceitful. That my heart will lie to me. That my, my, my thoughts will lie to me. Who I am will lie to me. And and. The Bible tells me that my heart is wicked and evil and deceitful. So why would I want to follow that which is going to destroy me? But we do. We absolutely want to follow those things that seek to destroy us. Jesus said that whoever loves his life will lose it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternity. You know, that's one of those things that, that is challenging, right? We just went over that a couple weeks ago. Whoever loves his life will lose it. The more that you try to hold on to this world and the things of this world, the more it's going to get ripped away from you. And the more that you try to cling to Jesus and try to cling to God, the less and less the world has an influence on you. It's that, that whole teeter-totter thing that, that, that we live. If you glorify yourself, man, God is going to be de-glorified. Whatever. And if you elevate, if you elevate yourself, God has to go down. And if you elevate God, you have to go down. <coughs> or even at set free. I mean, that's the context we're all in, Lord. Right? We're all, we're all in, set free in one way or another. Um, whether you got family here or whatnot, you're visiting. 
trying to figure out what you're supposed to be doing. Try to figure out what this life is for. Sitting in phase one or phase two or whatever the heck you're doing. Trying to figure out what the purpose of this all is. And why we, we are doing this. I start thinking, it's about sobriety. That's, that's what, honestly, that's what led most of us to set free is sobriety. The desire to get sober. Um, but then you get it and then what? Because the sobriety comes in just a few days. I mean, chemicals are out of the system and all that stuff. Of course, I understand that there's other things that go on with that. But your physical addiction is gone within a couple weeks. You don't need it anymore. So then, so, so is the meaning of life just being detoxed? Or is the meaning of life just being sober? Is, is, is that the whole call of our life is to be sober? If that's true, then all you needed was detox and you'd go on going about your day. But you guys tried that. I tried that. Sober wasn't it. Sober wasn't my purpose. And, and, and your purpose can't be just to remove something from your life. And plus, I mean, as far as the world goes, not everybody needs sobriety. A lot of people are actually sober. I don't know. They were weird to me, but they were there. They existed. I didn't understand it, but they existed. <clears throat> if sobriety was the meaning of life, then why is it not enough? Why is detox not enough? Why is getting rid of the alcohol and drugs, the whatever, not enough? Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong, man. Sobriety is great. It is fruitful. We, before we could go on with our life, sobriety needed to be a thing because our mind was messed up. Amen. But that's not the very purpose of why you're here. It might be your, what, what your internal struggle is. Your internal struggle might, might have been, yes, sobriety. That's why I'm here. That's what I, that's what I want. But is that the overall purpose of your life? Why did God bring you to set free? And where do you go from here? I mean, what, what's, what's the whole, whole thing? The Westminster Shorter Catechism, the very first question, says, what is man's primary purpose? Sorry, I have... A partial note in my pictures. What is man's primary purpose? The chief end of man. So the chief purpose of man. Yo, the whole reason why we were created is this. To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Amen. To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Psalm 86.9 says, All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. I was a little scatterbrained this week, so I did well, I'm a little scatterbrained all the time. But I I thought I put stuff in that I didn't put in. Romans eleven thirty six says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. For from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. Jesus is the centerpiece of our life. Amen. Jesus is the center of this world. Um, <clears throat> there's a word called Christocentric. It's one of my favorite words. The first time I've ever, I ever heard the word, I was <clears throat> taking a seminary class in Wyoming. <clears throat> and the teacher said Christocentric, and it just rang so true with me that my heart was just melted with that word. Because when you, when you hear, hear Christocentric, that means Christ is the center. That means everything is graded by Christ. Everything is measured against Christ. And Christ is the one that upholds this universe, is what it says by the word of his mouth in Hebrews 1. That, that Christ, that for him, to him, and through him are all things. In John chapter 1, it says that, that he is the word of God and that the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And it also says that 
by Him, through Him, and to Him are all things created. Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of this world, and to Him does belong all glory and honor forever. Amen. So, I do want to read one more thing. Psalm 116, 5 through 11. As gracious is the Lord and righteous, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed when I, even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. That was the wrong one. <laughs> it did hit home. Psalm 16, 5 through 11. Let's, let's try that one. Apparently it's time for an eye exam. For the Lord, the Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. That sounds better. The line has... The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to show and or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It goes a little bit closer to what uh, we're talking about today. I know sometimes we think that God is trying to keep secrets from us. That God is trying to hide our purposes from him but if the whole meaning of our life is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever that he makes these things plain sure there's secret things that there are secret things that belong to the Lord Deuteronomy 29 29 there's there are certain situations that God uh, conceals because it's not for us um, God is a God of election I just don't know who that is he has hidden that thing from people. God knows who are His. But He makes some things very, very clear to where the simple can understand or the very wise can understand. But we'll never be able to plumb the depths of who He is. The things that are necessary for salvation and life, for faith and practice, are so evident that anybody can understand them. Maybe in some things I have not emphasized obedience like I should have. Walking through resting in Christ. Trying to work out how resting in Christ and obedience to the commands work out has not been the easiest thing. But Obedience is of the utmost importance. Right. It truly is of the utmost importance. But we have to have the right perspective on obedience. Obedience is not a matter of trying to get right with God. That's, that's, that's where most of us are. i got to get right with God and then I'll come to Him. No, no, no. You will never get right with God on your own. You will never get right with God in, in your own Flesh, you will never get right with God on your own volition of your own will. It's not, it's not a matter of trying to get right with God, but it's a matter of because we are right with God, because God has done all these things, from the outflow of our faith, from the outflow of our relationship, comes obedience to God. Glorify God and to enjoy Him. Since we are stamped, approved by God, from that approval by God, we walk in His statutes in gratitude in who He is. He changes our hearts to desire the things that He desires. 
But before we really get into obedience, let's start with faith. Faith can be described as trust, belief, rest in Christ. We have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the light of his marvelous son. We have been transferred by faith, by trusting in God. And this faith is, is, is a gift of God. It's not even anything that you can work up in yourself. Faith is given to us by outside of ourselves. And our faith just isn't in nothing. Our faith is in, in, in not in faith, but our faith is in an object. And that object is Jesus Christ. God empowers us to believe that Jesus Christ is, 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 is it. It's God. Deity. Fullness. Everything. But our, our position must first be established in Christ. We live status forward, which means that we live like we're already there. Because we are already there, positionally. We live in the realm of the already and not yet. We've already received the gifts of God, but we have not yet received the gifts of God. Does that make sense? Who we are is set in stone, but we don't receive it yet. Ephesians 1. Positionally, we are already there, but practically, we are being renewed every day. Ephesians 1 says that we were established before the foundation of the earth. That, that I, I guess that's what Jackie preached last week was Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, which is awesome. Um, but that God chose us from before the foundation of the earth, the Spirit, or Christ, paid for us, and the Spirit sealed us until the day of redemption. And we become part of the family. We become adopted into the family of God. We become children of God where we can cry out, Abba, Father. We are adopted. We are justified. And then we begin this process of being sanctified, which means to be renewed every day in Him, to be made new in Him. But it all starts with that faith in Christ. We cannot be sanctified without being justified. Amen. Day in and day out, we are getting our butts worked over by God to conform us into His image. Amen. You know what? It's an act of God's free grace. The grace of God. That, that butt whipping that we get, the conviction in our heart, what I've been walking in, is a gift of God. And when you're in it, you're like, this ain't no gift. <laughs> but this is a gift of God, that God convicts our heart, that God changes our ways. Because if God's not convicting your heart, that's a scary place to be. Because you know where you're wrong. And if God's not convicting our heart that's where we gotta check ourselves now if you're a new believer or not a believer I get this I get this um, if this is your first day man hang, hang tight but our sanctification our conforming to the image of Christ what what, what is that that is an act of God's free grace. Do you know what part you have in your salvation? The sin. Do you know what part you have in your sanctification? The sin. That's your part. God transforms you. He changes your heart. He does this. All of this is because we are in Christ. That we have been adopted. You know, I think it's John 1.12. I'll read that real quick. Make sure I'm quoting the right scripture. John 1.12 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That we receive the spirit of adoption, that we become children of God. According to the London Baptist Confession, once we receive the spirit of adoption, once, once we are in this, we can boldly, boldly approach the throne room of grace. That we can boldly approach the throne room of grace. That we can cry out to God. That we are given access to the Father. 
by faith in the Son, that, that, that He is the conduit, that, that in His name we can approach the throne room of God. And what, what, what it says in, is that we are given the power to cry, Abba, Father. That's a very personal thing. It's not, it's not this distant thing, this, 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 this God that's so distant from us, but, but saying Abba, Father is like, it's an intimate relationship that we are with God. In Christ, we are with God. But in this, we are given compassion. We are protected. We are provided for and chastened by Him. Yet we will never be cast off. Part of this adoption, part of this new life, part of the sanctification is repentance. Oh, repentance. God grants us repentance to go from unbelief to, to belief. That's all. That, that when when uh, uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the first thing that, that Jesus preached was repent and be baptized before the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, therefore. And, and that, that's a big R repentance. That's where we go from, <clears throat> from unbelief to belief. It, it's, but that's that part is, is done all at once. We go from, from not believing to believing, and that's done. But that's not it. That's not it. John Calvin says that our life in Christ is defined by repentance. That repentance is something that we continue in daily. We are not called to live in sin. And in some cases, to celebrate sin, if we're okay with that, then we should check our hearts. And to see if we know God or just know about God. Psalm 51. Oh, yeah, yeah. Psalm 51. Verse 16 says. For you, know, you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. <laughs> David rightly saw that being broken hearted over sin was what needed when Nathan called him out. But when you have a high view of sin and a high view of yourself, repentance is not even on your, on your plate. Struggling with sin and diving headlong into sin are two different things. Struggling with sin means that, that you're battling within yourself, that you're, 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 you're working through it, God, and, and that you stumble and you struggle, and, and sometimes it's for a long time, but you struggle with it and, you, and, you, and you're, you're battling and your heart is torn up in it. Sometimes people jump into it without a care in the world. With this heart of, I know what God says, but I don't care. Because this is the way that I want to do it. This is the way that makes sense to me. I don't think we get it sometimes, though. Sometimes, man, we just don't get these things of God, do we? You've been freed. From a burden. Pilgrim's Progress kind of gives gives a good picture of it with, with the guy. I don't know if we've watched it in a long time, but carrying a backpack. Uh, his name is Christian. That's kind of odd. But he's carrying it and, and, and he's carrying all these burdens, carrying all these burdens, and then he meets a guy. I can't remember his name, it's like Savior or some Jesus or something like that. And 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 at that the backpack is taken away. The burden is lifted away. The things that were weighing him down were taken away. We've been freed from those burdens, from that sin that has so entangled us in our life. We've been freed from death. We've been freed from an eternity in hell. I think we forget that sometimes. I know I do. I forget that all the time. That, you know, think, get life on cruise control and start thinking that just floating through. on our way. Our purpose, though, 
It's to glorify God and to enjoy Him. Calvin, I like John Calvin. You guys, I quote him a lot. But he writes that God has pre pre uh, prescribed. You guys know what prescription is, right? No. <laughs> God has prescribed for us a way in which He will be glorified by us. That's awesome, right? God writes a prescription. Just take, take, take this and call me in the morning. God has prescribed for us a way in which He will be glorified by us, namely piety, which consists in the obedience of His word. He that exceeds these bounds does not go about to honor God, but rather to dishonor Him. And I, I, I threw out one of those words that is very close to another word that I throw out there that is bad. Piety is not bad. Piety is our, our acts of religion, is our acts of, of, of righteousness, our walk with God. Pietism is bad. It's based upon emotions. It's, it's based upon proving yourself to, to, to make sure that you are in the gospel. Make sure of this. And, and, and we base it upon uh, uh, emotionalism. How I feel today is whether or not I'm in, in Christ. <clears throat> and that is not good. Piety, though, is our acts of obedience worked out in God. Piety is good. Everybody has some sort of piety if they're in Christ. <clears throat> the Heidelberg Catechism is set up in three different ways. There's three different sections. first section is about our guilt. And it's, we are guilty before God. The second section talks about the grace of Christ that is poured on us. So what we've done and, and, and the grace of, of, of what God has done. And then after that, the third section is called gratitude. There are the three G's, great guilt, grace, and gratitude. And from gratitude, from the gratitude of what God has done, from being free from sin and death, from being free of all this, we obey the things of God. Amen. Out of gratitude for all. what he's done. Question six of the New City Catechism, which is the one that we go through, says, how can we glorify God? And the answer says, we glorify God by enjoying Him, loving Him, trusting Him, and by obeying His will, commands, and law. Deuteronomy 11.1 1 says, you shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep His charge, His statutes, His rules, and His commandments always. You shall love the Lord your God. This is the conundrum that we're in. This is really quite the, quite the thing because we are called to love God. But I can't love God enough. I can't love God enough. God deserves all that we have. But we can't give it all. Do you think that you love God enough? So that means that you can increase in your love. Do you have a desire? I hope, I hope that there's some kind of desire to love God. If we, the, the thing is that if we think that we love God enough, then we're so riddled with pride, we probably don't love God at all. And that pride has deceived us in so many ways. We do not and cannot love God like we're supposed to. I think sometimes people miss the point of set free. They miss it because sometimes out of the outflow of the, of the little side stuff, people get sober. But reality is, is a lot of people don't stay sober. Um, and I don't think that's a failure. Um, I believe that, that what we are called to do is share the gospel. And my call is to Create, is, is to show you guys Christ. And we're called to be worshipers of God. Because God has called us from darkness to light. And then He has given this, this 
this way for us to obey, these things for us to do in order to glorify, that God has prescribed for us. We got this prescription that 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 He has called us to obey and to live out this life that He He has drawn us to. The, what, what I'm about to say, you're going to probably hear a lot from me. If you've just got here, you're going to hear this a lot because I believe this is a very vital, vital thing in 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 our walk with Christ. Because God has told us what to obey. He has told us what to do. He has shown us. The law consists of commands and exhortations. Um, there are dietary laws. We don't, those, those aren't part of what we're doing. We're talking about moral laws. The things that we are to do. The things that, that we are to follow to honor God. And there's commands and there's exhortations of what God has required. In different ways we use the law, which is good. The law is good. We don't read it as good, do we? We, we, we read these things and we're like, oh my God, I can't do that. What the heck is this about? And then it's like, well, I'm under grace. We're under grace. We're in New Covenant. Yeah, we are. But we cannot use the grace of God as a license to do what we want. It's not a get out of hell free heart. It's not just this thing that we receive and, and, and can live any old way that we want. Paul tells Timothy, I think it's the first Timothy, that the law is good when it is used lawfully, when it's used correctly. And so, how do we know what to do? How do we know what pleases God? We follow the law. Romans 3 says that, you know, uh, 331 I think it is, it says, Paul, Paul says, do we uh, just ignore the law or abolish the law? Um, because of grace, by no means, we uphold the law. And we're going to go over two ways that the law is good. There's three of them, but we're only going to talk about two because the other one's kind of just, it's for our day-to-day -day walk or our day-to-day -day life in, in the society. But the, the first thing is, is, is if you've ever read the law of God, the boring parts... <coughs> <clears throat> or like 1 Corinthians 6 where it says that if you're this, 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 and this then you will never inherit the kingdom of God it talks, it talks about being uh, revilers, swindlers, drunkards immoral, all, all that stuff it says you have no part in the kingdom of God and that's that's a law well, I, I remember when I uh, when I read that I about packed my stuff and said I'm wasting my time because I will never inherit the kingdom of God my first time at set free I would never inherit the kingdom of God if it was completely based upon that. But then it's also said that you were justified, you were sanctified, you, you were being renewed in Christ Jesus. So the first use shows God's holiness to people that we look at the law and it should break your heart because you can't do it. You cannot uphold the law. And sometimes, man, we, we're like, how cruel is that that God would give us something to do that we cannot do? But... Grace of God is poured out on His people. Yeah. Romans eight three says that what what the law could not do because it was limited by the flesh, which is us, what I could not do, God did by sending His Son to die on the cross. Amen. God did what we couldn't do. God upheld the law on our behalf. Think about that. Jesus Christ is the second part of the Godhead. God came in the flesh to walk like us. Because only flesh can pay for flesh. Romans, what is it? Hebrews 9.22 says that, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Only flesh can pay for flesh. And Romans 5.9 says that, that the wrath of God is revealed. He took the wrath of God. Only God can take the wrath of God and survive. God died on our behalf. And that that it's called third use of law. We use it to know the will of God. We use it as a guide for our life. We use it to know what God wants. I mean, there's some things that are that are, that are obvious. First uh, Thessalonians says to be thankful in all things for this is the will of God. There, there, there's all kinds of little those little gems in there that, that just say this is the will of God. Oh, cool! I need to hold on to that. Be thankful in all things. Well, that's hard. 
But then I read a quote. I don't know. I'm not there yet. We use the third, the third use of law as a guide for our life. And thank God, man, that Jesus Christ covers the sin. Will we fall short? Can we miss the mark every day now? But what do we do when we miss the mark? We can be rebellious and we can try to hide from God in fear that God's going to find out and handle His business. Or we can cry out to God as the loving Father that He is and tell Him, man, I, I, I messed up. I need you. And God grants us the repentance that gives us life. So we glorify God in our walk with Him by trusting, by resting in His perfect work on our behalf for salvation. Repenting of the sin that we commit and we walk through as we walk in and struggle continually. We struggle with this, man. We struggle in, in, in all aspects of this. <laughs> Following Him in obedience to His law as imperfect as we are. I'm going to quote this. It's a paraphrase from uh, John Moffat. <clears throat> and and I, I, I changed some things around to kind of make it work in our context. It says, you don't obey enough you can't obey enough to merit favor with God. <clears throat> but we walk by faith, trusting the grace of God is applicable for our life. And since we are heirs of the kingdom, see, this is, we are already in position with Christ. Since we are heirs of the kingdom with Christ, we obey joyfully, knowing His grace covers our shortcomings. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord. Broken. Messed up. We come to you in need. We come to you needing you. But we know the only reason we can come to you, Lord, is because you draw us to yourself, Lord, and you began a work that you will carry on to completion. Lord, that you began a work that, that will carry forth until the day that you return or, or the day that you call us home. Lord, the struggle is in this life is so, so difficult, Lord. <clears throat> Walking through these things, Lord, <clears throat> being messed up, <clears throat> not knowing all that we have to do or not even being able to carry out the things that we need to do, Lord. We rest in your grace and your strength, Lord. <clears throat> Lord, lead us to repent in the places that we need to repent. Lead us to, to celebrate in the victories that we have, Lord, knowing that you are the king, that you are the one that has, has done all this, Lord. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Now before we go